point, we might have lost. Uh, okay, we do have music now. If you go, it's live on YouTube. Oh. I'm still. I'm still. There. Oh, you're still there. <laughs> I just wanted to try outside again, so my kids don't bark and. Well, please tell me if it's spotty and I'll go right back. Actually, it's better. I'm sorry. I didn't want to interrupt you, but yes, it's better. Okay, <laughs> good. I'll just stay here then. All right. I'm going to go ahead and admit the waiting room so we can get started anytime. time. Good. Okay. I'll just stay here then. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our virtual Darwin Day. We are so excited that you're joining us here today to learn a little bit more about how genetic adaptations of whales can help us understand and learn about human diseases and human health. So um, my name is Nancy, and I will be your host. And with me is Dr. Jason Sumarelli. And Dr. Jason Sumarelli is the director of research for the Duke Comparative Oncology Group, and he co-leads a team focused on understanding cancer through the lens of comparative and evolutionary biology. Uh, Dr. Jason, welcome. Thank you so uh, much for being with us. Thank you, Nancy. Thanks. It's great to be here. Well, virtually here, I virtually. guess. Exactly. Yes. I know that you have a very special icebreaker question for our audience. So if you want to say that, and then I can start sharing my screen because we are going to go through a very quick Zoom tutorial. So go ahead, um, yes. tell them about the icebreaker question. Yeah, it's a, a very critical question. You need, to, you need to think about this. It's super important. What is your favorite marine organism? So I said organism doesn't have to be a mammal. It can be... If your favorite marine organism is seaweed of some kind, that's totally that's totally appropriate. Uh, and and you can give me a little reason why if you want to. You can throw it in the chat. Somebody has plankton counts. Plankton counts. Living things count. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, put it in the chat. I'm I'm gonna um, I'm gonna put mine just to get things kicked off. <clears throat> Yeah, that's awesome. Yes. And so just to talk a little bit about the Zoom uh, features that are available to you, um, because we are streaming um, this presentation on YouTube, uh, your videos will be turned off and uh, you will be muted throughout the whole presentation. Um, but we do have closed captioning available. So just if you need it, just click on that little CC button at the bottom of your screen and uh, then um, you will see a little um, sign that says like show subtitles. So you click on that. And if you do that, um, you will get to a screen where you can actually adjust this, the font size and um, so that it's uh, better for you throughout uh, the whole presentation. And um, then also, uh, as you can see, our um, Darwin speaker and our Darwin guests, they are kind of like obscuring uh, the slideshow. Um, and so to have a better view, what we recommend is that you click that little speaker view at the, uh, at the top, and then you uh, go to view options, and you go all the way down and you click on side-by-side -side mode. And when you do that, the speaker will be on the side and his presentation will be next to it. And you have that little slide bar um, that you can uh, use to adjust uh, the size of the slides and, and uh, the, the, the size of the, uh, the speaker. So, and then last but not least, we do want to hear from you. We want to hear all your comments, your observations, all your questions that you have, because we're going to feed that to Jason, right? I mean, uh, he's going to be answering questions throughout his uh, presentation. Uh, but please be good digital citizens. And I mean, don't spam uh, the chat and uh, make sure that all your questions and your comments and um, your observations are relevant to the topic and also, you know, just be kind and respectful to everybody. And so with that, I'm going to stop sharing my presentation and I'm going to just ask Dr. Jason to start. <laughs> Great. Thank yeah, so Thank you. I'll start sharing uh, my presentation now and mm -hmm. 
hopefully everyone can see this. So, uh, Nancy, can you can you all see okay? I do. Yes, I can Great. see perfectly. Thank you. Great. Thank you. I'm sorry the wind is blowing in my hair because I'm right outside on a little patio at an Airbnb and I have a beautiful view of the ocean and I won't um, I won't uh, brag too much about that. So I won't even show you, but it's there. It's great. I'm listening to the waves right now. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to be here and talk to you all about some of the things we're doing at Duke University to learn from the marine environment um, and, and ways to better understand those organisms, conserve and protect those organisms, but also learn about those organisms to better fight human diseases like cancer. So I'm going to talk to you a bit about that today. So this is my outline for my presentation. I always think it's a good idea to have an outline and tell people what we're going to talk about. And this, this is sort of the goal for today. I'm going to talk to you about really, who am I? What am I? What do I know about anything? Why am I here? Uh, I will talk to you about our, our initiative on oceans and human health. Then I'll move to more science specific questions or, or points like the importance of oxygen in mammals and how we use a thing called systems biology to understand responses to the environment like a uh, lack of oxygen. And then I'll give an example of how a particular marine mammal, dolphins, bottlenose dolphins, hold their breath so well and what we've done using systems biology to figure that out. So I'll try to explain all of that stuff. The thing I want to make clear right away is that this should be very interactive and discussion based. I never uh, have as much fun just talking to people, talking at people. I have a much more fun time and I know the audience always has a better time when they get to ask questions and Nancy and others are going to help me field questions from the chat. If you have questions on YouTube, please um, feel free to put them in the comments in YouTube. And there is somebody monitoring YouTube as well. And they will be able to give me the questions uh, either, either in, in the course of the presentation or at the end. So please, please ask questions. Well, this is a bit about me. This is where I came from, a small little town in upstate New York uh, called Port Jervis, New York. It's actually a small part of that called Huguenot, New York, but it's a tiny little town, only 9,000 people in the town and not, um, not a college around really. So I didn't, my, none of my parents went to college. None of my fa immediate family went to college. I grew up in a relatively poor part of New York with not a lot of, um, availability in my immediate family of like highly educated people. So I didn't really know what I was doing. I just, uh, I just knew I wanted to be a scientist. I knew I wanted to explore the natural world. Um, spending a lot of time, you can see these beautiful mountains. I spent a lot of time in these mountains, learning about nature, exploring nature. And I really just knew I wanted to preserve and conserve natural systems. And I wanted to help the many people that I saw in my family and the many people I saw you know, surrounding me in my community with cancer and other diseases. I, I then traveled about four and a half hours north to a place called Rochester, New York. And there I went to Nazareth College, uh, a small liberal arts college, a four-year college. Um, and I then got a master's degree in uh, at a place called the State University of New York at Brockport, just a little bit down the road from Rochester, about 30 minutes right between Rochester and Buffalo. This is a picture of Nazareth, beautiful Nazareth College. Um, I was an environmental science major, so I focused on uh, understanding ecology and evolution and environment interactions, and, and I did most of my work in that at SUNY Brockport in my master's degree as well. So from my undergraduate and my master's degree, I then went all the way down here to this, to Miami, this little dot down here, Miami, Florida, totally different environment. I did my PhD in molecular biology, understanding how molecules in cells um, dictate and coordinate a response to different things, all kinds of different things, oxygen and all kinds of different things. 
Um, but this is beautiful FIU, Florida International University, a huge, huge campus. I had no idea what I was doing. I had to move here all by myself. I didn't have any friends or anything. I had to make friends all by myself without knowing anyone uh, beforehand. And it was a campus of 28,000 students. So a gigantic campus from this, from this small town, growing up in this small town. And, and then I traveled to Duke. And, and you all probably know where Duke is, so I don't need to show you a map, right? But, uh, well, maybe not. Some of you on YouTube might not. But Durham, North Carolina, uh, this is a picture of the Duke Chapel. Um, and, and I did a postdoc. So I'm, I won't bother to count how many years, but it's a lot of years, probably around 15 years of training, even before I joined Duke University as a faculty member. And now as a faculty member, I work in the Medical Center and the Cancer Institute. This is just another picture of Duke's campus. And I'm doing my work on predominantly on cancer biology, uh, but also looking at the marine, um, the marine medicine aspects that I'll talk to you about. And I have uh, a wife and my wife it worked doing her PhD at the Marine Lab, the Duke, the Duke Marine Lab in Beaufort, North Carolina. And that's where I am now. I'm in Beaufort, North Carolina. It's about three hours west, uh, east rather, of, of Durham. And um, that's where I spent a lot of time learning and collaborating with experts in marine biology. And so we really have these beautiful partnerships of uh, molecular biology and cancer biologists in Durham and all these marine biologists who know all kinds of stuff about the marine system in in Beaufort and we work together very closely and I'll I'll give you an example of some of that work today. So the marine environment is a beautiful place, right? It's it's got tremendous diversity of living things and of environments. So things that are coral reefs and near shore estuarine places these beautiful tidal pools down to these deep, deep trenches that you could fit many, many, many Empire State Buildings inside, you know, big, big, deep areas. There's a huge diversity of environment. Um, but, you know, the beauty is sometimes is sometimes uh, brought down by a lot of the human impacts that we put on the marine environment. And so, this is a picture of um, an albatross breeding ground uh, far out in the Pacific uh, on an island. And, um, you know, you can see all of the fishing gear and everything that's washed up on the shore here, all the plastic debris. So we really have to be mindful of the things that we do um, and the impacts that we have on these on these organisms and on these systems. And we really are trying at, at Duke to bridge these two things together, to bring awareness to our environment and improve understanding of how we impact the marine environment, but also how we can learn from the marine environment to uh, improve our, our own human health and our disease treatments. Um, and we really wanna do this as a way to train next generation students and provide equity and enhance social justice and environmental justice for everyone. Um, so I have a few questions for the audience and, and you can again just use that chat feature or use the comment feature in YouTube. How, how much of the globe of earth does the ocean cover? And you can just throw those throw those answers in the chat and I'll I'll have a I'll have a look give your seven somebody 70 percent okay so a lot a lot yeah a lot a good good answer yes it's it's more than half you have 75 right. yeah 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 you all are you all are doing great with your guesses so it's 71 percent 83 90 wow so it's not that much 71 percent how much within that 71 percent of the earth of the earth's surface how much uh of of the living organisms, what percent of the li total living organisms are in the marine environment? So we're waiting to see if we can get some answers. Please put them in the chat. Somebody's guessing unknown. Oh, well, you know what? 
Yeah. Yeah. Let's go with estimated, Meredith. That's a great, great okay. point. So we have yeah. 85, 80, 85. I think we might have we might have an an expert in our midst. Eighty percent of living organisms uh, in the marine in the marine environment, and then. This is kind of a different spin, and I'll tell you why we're talking about this. What does this have to do with marine environment, you might ask? But how, how many anti-cancer drugs come from natural sources, like a plant, uh, a sponge, a something, you know, a living natural product? 90%. A lot of people say 90. Some people thinking a high percent. You're, you're, you're right in the sense that it's a high percent. It's not that much, but it's about two thirds, about two thirds of the current anti-cancer agents that we use, the medicines that we use are coming from natural sources. And so most of these are not found or have not been found or discovered in the marine environment yet. And that's not because they're not there. 80% of all the living things are there. It's because we haven't looked and we haven't explored those spaces yet at enough depth and with enough knowledge and sustainably and appropriately to conserve them. We haven't done that hard work yet. And so this we think represents, and I say it in the title here, you can always, you can always get a hint of what I'm going to tell you about uh, with my title. I give away the punchline. But this is really an untapped resource, right, for new human health um, solutions. So somebody gave a, a giant number, but that's that's not it. But yes, 63%, about two thirds. And so I, I mentioned this, but we have um, we do a lot of training. We have a scholars in marine medicine program at Duke where undergraduates get to do all these amazing things in the lab. They get to interact and uh, work with marine mammals um, and collect samples from them and understand them uh, and then come back to the lab and study them. So this is one of the efforts that we're taking in the lab to improve our understanding and improve people's uh, engagement with the with natural world, with the natural world. Um, I'm, I'm going to transition now to some more uh, more science based talk uh, part of the talk and and this this is part where I think we take for granted that oxygen in the air that we're breathing is really essential to what we're doing. It's essential to everything. And the reason do people do people have a guess at the reason why this oxygen might be essential? What do we use oxygen for? And, and you can you can sort of stay quite broad here, but what is it that we use oxygen for? And I'll sort of wait here a second so that people can plop a plop a guess. There's no there's no problem guessing. You know, nobody's going to there's no grade at the end of this. Um, you're not going to be sent a million dollars if you get all the answers right. I'm sorry to say I don't have that kind of money. But um, I would if I could. Cells need it. Yes, absolutely. Our cells are building blocks. The things that build our bodies, cells need it. Yes, somebody said electron transport chain, making ATP. That's right. All of those things are correct. And I will just group those into uh, one category and say we need it for turning our food uh, that we take in into energy for our cells. We need to make energy from the food that we eat and the way that we make energy from the food that we eat uh, is very simply is through using oxygen. There are organisms that don't require oxygen. They use other things, but mammals, other multicellular organisms, almost all of us, we require oxygen to make energy from the food that we eat. And I would, I would say you will learn very quickly that you need oxygen. If you were to go to a place like way, way, way up high Mount Everest, or even one of these big mountains in the Rocky Mountains, uh, or you were to free dive deep into the ocean as far as you could, or hold your breath as far as you could, you would have, um, 
you would very quickly understand, uh uh-oh, I think I maybe need to take a breath. Something is wrong. I'm out of a key resource that I need. So this is just a picture of Mount Everest, folks transiting up and uh, a free diver. And these are two areas that we think about where there might be a low oxygen environment. I've, I've held my breath and I'm quite, uh, as part of a class where we had to, we had to do this and I'm quite bad at it. I, I, I should tell you. Um, and, and here are some of the clinical, meaning some of the things that happen to your body, um, symptoms of low oxygen and, and the time it takes to recognize those. So at about 20%, 19.5% is like the minimal acceptable oxygen that we can tolerate. If you start to go down in the percent oxygen that you can get into your body, you start to have poor judgment, impaired coordination. You, you start to breathe heavier to get more oxygen in. Eventually, you get really bad symptoms. You start to fail mentally. You pass out. You become nauseous. You vomit even. At, at eight minutes at a percent of six to eight percent oxygen this is fatal you can die from this if you know it's about half of that peop- of those people can't even make it six minutes so we absolutely need oxygen to m- turn our food into energy for cellular function and this hasn't always been the case so the, the earth has been, been around for billions, you know, four and a half or so billion years. Uh, life has been on the earth, we estimate, uh, for about three and a half to four billion years. And really, oxygen in our, in our atmosphere hasn't, um, hasn't really increased to the levels that we see today for the past, you know, half a billion years. We're talking in in a large geologic kind of time span, we're talking about a very short sliver of time here. And and here are some other sort of facts and figures that I thought were really interesting that I learned about in studying this problem. And one of the great things about studying problems across different fields or different disciplines of science is that you're constantly learning. And I love learning. I love understanding new facts and, and solving new problems. And I, I heard some of these facts from my, from my uh, surgeon colleagues. About one in 15 patients who undergo a surgery become slightly hypoxic or they get what's called hypoxemia. And, and does somebody have a guess what hypoxia means or hypoxemia? And they're, they're slightly different terms, but I would take, I would take just a guess at what hypoxia is. I'm just, I'm just going to check the, yeah, exactly. Not enough oxygen in your tissue relative to what your normal amount is. So one in 15 patients, it's 2021, almost 2022. And still many folks who have surgery, their tissues, uh, don't get enough oxygen, uh, a, a smaller number, but still a substantial number of patients uh, have hypoxemia, this low oxygen level for five minutes during a surgery. And, and about one in 20 patients who undergo a long surgical procedure, a very long one, um, can end up with long-term organ damage during these long surgeries. So this, this is really a problem in surgical settings, this idea of having low oxygen. And it's also a problem in the context of cancer. I'm a cancer biologist, so I'm interested in in this problem. Uh, This is the research that I do. So tumors, cancers are just big growths of cells that are growing out of sort of out of control. They're not paying any attention anymore to the fact that they should act as a tissue they've sort of become like a single cell growing, just growing, just growing, not paying any attention to what the body is telling the cells to do. They become hypoxic and the areas that have low oxygen have an increase in their, um, in their resistance to our current medicines. So we give a medicine, most of the time this will kill the cancer, but if there's a hypoxic, a low oxygen region of these tumors that can promote, that can turn on 
genes that become make the cancer drug resistant. So that is a big problem. The other thing that hypoxia or low oxygen can do is it can tell the cancer cells, let's leave. There's no oxygen here. Let's get out and get into the bloodstream and go somewhere else. And these are the really fatal, uh, hard to treat cancers that, that cause death in cancer patients these days. It's not so much that there's a lump a growing uh, of growing cells. It's more that these cells have become resistant to our medicine and now they've moved throughout the body and hypoxia or low oxygen tissue oxygen uh, drives or controls those processes. Again, um, I'm sorry, Dr. Jason, can you go back yeah. to that one slide? Sure, sure. Because um, a, a question that just popped up is like, um, if you have these cancer cells and part of those cancer cells um, are hypoxic, um, is that the part that you can potentially just remove surgically uh, and then just, uh, you know, start doing drugs with that? Is that, I mean, one upper, uh, well, possibility? Yeah, it, it is. It is an important treatment that we use and it really improvements in surgery, removing the entire area, uh, mm -hmm. the entire mass that people wouldn't maybe target only the hypoxic regions. They would take all, as much cancer out as they can right? Um, because there's no telling that another part might become hypoxic later. So you get all of it as much as you can out that. Uh, has become a really effective treatment for many cancers. Surgery is is basically the mainstay, the main one of the main ways that we that we treat cancer these days, um, along with some other things like radiation mm -hmm. and chemotherapy. But but surgery is a critical component to removing these these tumors. Now, mm -hmm. what can happen is tumors grow so fast before you even see that you have cancer. Uh, they can grow so fast that sometimes this hypoxia can happen. Sometimes this can happen uh, before you can tell or are symptomatic. Um, so, so that's where, you know, hypoxia can occur before you have a chance to remove a tumor um, or it's spread and you don't know it, for example. So these things can happen. Um, you know, all, all manner of things can happen in terms of what happens with patients with cancer, for sure. But that, that's a great question. Yes, the goal is to get this out of the body as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Great question. Keep, keep questions coming. Um, I, I would love to be doing more question and answer as much as I can. Um, so this low oxygen problem is not just a problem for uh, people with cancer or people undergoing surgery, but the, the world's oceans are also becoming more hypoxic as global temperatures in the oceans rise, less oxygen can be dissolved in the water. And as nutrients, more human led nutrients go into coastal areas. And you can see these hypoxic areas are dotted along the coast where all of these tons and tons of nutrients are getting out into local uh, coastal areas. This causes the oxygen to go down. And so organisms that are in these areas are, are having a hard time taking in oxygen in, in their, uh, in their uh, whatever mechanism they're using. So this is a problem, not only for people, but also for ocean uh, organisms. And uh, it's always, useful to talk about something that's relevant in, in our time right now, something in the minds of everyone. Patients with uh, COVID-19 infection suffer, often suffer from hypoxia. They can't get enough oxygen in to their body because the infection in their lungs has damaged their lungs. It's taken over the cells. And now there's no, so much lung damage that the cells, the lung cells can't take in the appropriate uh, amount of oxygen. So that is a very important um, mechanism that we're trying to understand. So like I said, uh, this is not, that's not a picture of me, but it might as well be. I was 
really terrible at holding my breath. And people, humans in general, are quite bad, as I showed you, at tolerating hypoxia. But do you know what isn't bad at tolerating hypoxia? Well, we think we know that marine organisms, marine mammals, like the beaked whale, the Cuvier's beaked whale, or the sperm whale, or the elephant seal, we think these marine mammals are really well adapted to low oxygen tolerance. They can take low levels of oxygen in their tissue, uh, we, we think, we believe. And they, we think this because they spend, many of them, 90, 80 to 90 to 95 percent of their lives at depth diving. They're not at the surface for 95 percent of their time. We are at the surface uh, above water for almost 100 percent of our lives, most of us. And whales and seals and dolphins they are all diving to depths. Some of these whales, like the Cuvier's beaked whale, have been shown to dive for hours to depths as high, as low as uh, you could stack seven or eight Empire State Buildings down. So huge depths down below the water, the surface, and they hold their breath this entire time. They come up, they take a breath, and they dive. So we thought this would be a just an ideal way to understand mechanisms that these organisms have adapted to tolerate this low oxygen condition. And in my lab, we, we study cells. So I can't sadly, or maybe not sadly, I can't get a colony of a pod of blue whales in the animal facility that we have, right? Maybe some mice, okay. Uh, but I can't get a bunch of blue whales. They're just too big, right? So we study, we are able to understand cellular adaptations uh, by, by taking samples from these organisms um, in, in safe and effective ways. And then we're able to sample skin and blood from these organisms so that we understand how they've adapted. So we really want to connect the whole body to the cellular function here. And and I'll move to a sort of maybe silly example of how cells respond to the environment. And maybe nobody's ever thought of this before in the audience, but uh, we should we should try to I'll try to help you think through how this happens. When when cells respond or encounter something like low oxygen, a bunch of things have to happen. The cell has to maybe move away, or the cell has to maybe uh, turn off its metabolism, rest itself, go dormant. Maybe it has to stop dividing. Maybe it has to divide. Maybe it has to repair damage. It has to do all these things to when it encounters different environmental uh, uh, inputs, right? And the way that this happens is genes go up or down. Genes are turned on, genes are turned off. So this, this might as well be uh, a, a picture of me on any given day because I have three little kids and my three little kids, uh, their entire job right now is to prevent me from sleeping. So they, they are awake all the time and um, even at night and, you know, somebody always needs something at night. And so I get up in the morning, I'm so tired. Usually you see already, you probably tell I'm so, you know, so tired. And, and I, so I'm, I'm here, I am at my desk having to write a grant, right? Or write a paper, scientific paper. I'm having to do something. Oh, I'm so tired. So what do I do? Well, I usually turn to coffee. I turn to caffeine. That's my, um, that's my sort of defense mechanism for being so tired. And that is an input, right? I drink some caffeine and I have some sort of physiologic input. And what does that do? Well, that turns on a bunch of genes. There is not a coffee gene and a cold uh, weather gene and a hot weather gene and a, you know, low oxygen gene. There's not a gene for everything, right? There are groups of genes that respond together. And you might think of these genes as some going down in, you know, blue sort of indicates cold or down, you know, this goes down. Some get a little hotter, some go up, right? So some are turned on, some are turned off. And maybe if you thought of the columns as different people or different species, we might be a little different in our response, 
but generally we have similar many similarities, especially within species. Uh, all humans might do relatively similar responses. And you can trace the interactions between these genes. So you might say, oh, well, gene A turns on gene B. So you put a little edge between, you put a little line between them. Gene B turns off gene C, and how does that affect gene A? So you can look at how these genes interact in networks. And this really is the subject of systems biology, thinking about how genes turn on and off in response to inputs like coffee, caffeine. And that has some response, right? It turns, dilates my eyes. It gets me, my heart rate going a little bit. It makes me feel alert and ready to tackle whatever thing I was about to fall asleep uh, doing before. So genes act together in systems, uh, networks. And, and I just want to um, give, give a, a little example of how we use this approach, this systems biology type of approach to, to understand mechanisms of breath hold adaptation in bottlenose dolphins. Before I do that, um, I just, I just want to make sure there's no questions. If anybody has a question, I'm happy to pause now. Otherwise, I'll, I'll, keep, I'll keep plugging through. Um, and I have a question, so you can put your questions in the chat, put them in the comments on YouTube. Nancy, any other questions folks have, or should I keep, keep going as is? Well, I had one question and that okay. is or it has to do with sampling basically. And um because you were talking about the fact that um you at Duke are interested in in, in cells and I'm wondering yes. what kind of tissues that you sample from um the whales and you know how you get those samples and yeah. you know what the process is of getting the samples and getting it into your lab and like yeah. That's a great, that's a great question. Um, I have some slides a little further down that are beyond, beyond this example. And I'll maybe Nancy, if, if it's okay, I'll, I'll go through this example. I'll come back to that and show some of those, those pictures of what we've done. And maybe that will help me illustrate to folks how I do that. Does that sound good? Yes, that's excellent. Thank great. you. Yeah, of course. That's a great question. Terrific question. Um, my question for folks, put it in the chat or put it in the comments. How many genes does a, let's say a human, just as a, as an example, how many genes roughly do we have in our genomes? So you can just take guesses at that and I'll, I'll check them. I won't sit here and uh, wait for you, but you can just plop them in the chat and I'll, I'll, I'll give you i I'll tell you the answer in a little bit. So the work I'm going to talk about is the, the hard work of a student named Ashley Blauis. She's a PhD candidate in Doug Novacek's lab, and she um, sort of spearheaded this work to understand this. And what, what she did was sort of a simple thing, um, and her work is, uh, is, in, is the subject of this paper, and you can check this paper out. It's a scientific paper, so um, it may be a little bit technical, but you can get a sense for it. And if you follow me on Twitter, um, you can you can check out the little Twitter thread that I did on this. But this is sort of the, the schematic. What Ashley did was she collected blood from these dolphins. This You can see the dolphin is upside down from how it normally would be. Its, um, its blowhole is in the water, and it's doing a voluntary breath hold. This is not a forced breath hold in any way. You can see that it's just hanging out, happy. Um, there and there has to be some blood draws for quality um for a health assessment so when they do these health assessments to make sure the dolphins are healthy they also get these blood draws they say well do you want would you hold your breath they give a, a cue or a command the dolphins uh if they're willing to do it they do it and we're able to collect blood uh from different time during sort of these health assessments and over time uh, we we uh, are able to collect blood from the same individual. So at, at baseline, three minutes of breath holding, and they can go up to four and a half or five minutes of breath holding uh, just, just without um, any, any issues. The level of dolphin compliance uh, is very, very close to 100%, um, Kerry. It, you know, they, they basically have this way of training these dolphins, and I can't do it justice, but... It's a great question, but 
they're they're super sort of contented where they are and so they've trained them in a way that it is totally voluntary but they're basically happy to do it um they get a lot of positive reinforcement love and you know they get a lot of like affection positive reinforcement and food when they do something so there's there's always incentive positive reinforced incentive to do it um so here's a little video i hope it i hope it plays for y'all um on on any it's not going to of course oh that's that's too bad well i i will just skip back and say this is sort of what what they do they're upside down and then they turn to take a breath and then we take are able to take another um where they take another uh, uh, sample. So that that's a really interesting way of doing that. Yeah, exactly. It's the same when we give blood. There's always OJ and cookies. And, and if you haven't donated blood, you get OJ and cookies. So go off and do that. It's great. Um, I'll skip through this. Uh, I'm sorry that didn't play, y'all. But we can turn those data into these networks of genes. These are all genes that turn on during breath holding. So compared to our baseline sample, these are genes that turned that went up. And you can see the bigger a circle is, the circles are the genes, the bigger a circle is, the more up this thing, the more this thing turned on. And the smaller it is, like maybe some of these, and the less red, the less they turned on. So we can look at these networks and say, oh, what are the what are the things that turned on the most? And we can see by the color and by the size. But we can also do some statistics so we can look at how these genes interact. We can say, oh, well, maybe this gene goes up, but it's kind of at the edge. It's not really interacting with other genes. Uh, and so we can apply statistics to understand how connected some of these genes are. So now what we've done here is we've just prioritized these genes by how much they're upregulated, how much they're turned on during breath holding, but also how much how connected they are to other genes. And we found this one gene that we became really interested in that was the most connected gene in the network that also turns on. So it turns on during breath holding and it's very, very connected to other things that turn on. So we thought, oh, this would be a really interesting one to study. And it turns out that we just stumbled upon this by chance, you know, just by under, trying to understand it. This gene makes this little chemical, the, the product of this gene makes this little chemical called a leukotriene. Sorry, I'm, there it is. And so leukotrienes uh, are, have been studied before. We, we looked back at some of these papers and we found, oh, these are chemicals, small chemicals made by this ALOX5 enzyme that cause vasoconstriction. So what might be vasoconstriction? Well, you can take a guess for what vasoconstriction is, but I'll, I'm about to tell you so if you don't feel like guessing. Vasoconstriction. So we think we have a gene, ALOX5. It makes a little chemical output it puts something out, uh, turns um, a certain chemical in our body into this thing called leukotrienes, and these result in vasoconstriction, a physiologic output. And we think that uh, what this is doing is vasoconstriction means vessels constricting. So your blood vessels, these dolphins' blood vessels, we think, may be constricting. What is that doing? It's taking all the oxygenated blood that remains and putting it in the important parts of the body. And that we think is maybe what's part of the solution that marine mammals have this thing that they have this genetic or molecular um, response, this gene expression response. They turn on a gene, it produces a chemical and that in, induces some vessel constriction that pushes blood to the good, the most important parts of the body, the heart and the brain. Folks had some guesses about how many genes there are in a genome. There's about 20,000. So Carrie is uh, a skelly, you're on it. Carrie, you're off by 
just a little, but thank you for guessing. And great other questions here. <laughs> so the other really cool thing we found, and, and Nancy, stop me if I'm over time or, or whatever, feel free. Um, we studied this whole family of genes. We said, well, what, when did these genes start to exist in, in animals? And we found that these genes, so we were able to map the number of copies of these genes. So if you're yellow, uh, like mammals, you have every one of the genes in this family. If you're, if you're like this uh, yellowish, whitish color down here, you don't have these genes. So there's no copies of this gene in the genome. So these early organisms, yeast and insects, even the hagfish, this sort of uh, primordial fish, they don't have uh, any of this gene family, but mammals have all of them. And we were able to look of some of many of these genes. You can see they're a little yellower. Some of these are orange, right? And so many of these genes uh, are, are, have, you know, these, these naked mole rat and Chinese hamster, they have two or three or four or five copies of these genes. And so we're like, what are, what do these things do? Well, these organisms are in, live in tunnels. They're small rodents that live in tunnels, in burrows, and they live in constant low oxygen environments. And we think this is unpublished. It has not been peer reviewed, but we think that it's possible that these organisms, the way that they tolerate low oxygen all the time in their whole life, not breath holding, not going down and up and down and up, is they have these genes activated or turned up all the time because they're encountering low oxygen all the time. This again is just a guess, just what we would call hypothesis in science. It's not been rigorously sort of studied the way some of these other things have, but it's it's given us a clue to something to look at in the next chapter of the work that we're doing. So Carrie has a question, is there an effect if they are in a high oxygen environment? Yeah, so we think there are mechanisms and I haven't studied this, uh, others have, but we think that some of the ways that some marine mammals are are dealing with low oxygen environments is that they're becoming hyperoxic. In other words, they're able to take in a lot of oxygen during their breath hold. And that allows them to utilize that oxygen very efficiently, more efficiently than we can. But yes, we think there are hyperoxic um, mechanisms at, at place. Now, oxygen is kind of a, uh, can be a double-edged sword. Oxygen is essential, but it can also create oxidation. It can create damage. So if there's too much oxygen or that oxygen is not being stored and utilized effectively by the cell, it can cause DNA damage. And then you need some repair effect to take place. So we think about oxygen as having both a very positive, obviously, effect, but then there can be these unintended consequences of oxygen being almost, it can be toxic at, at, at its own levels. So we need to think about those, those balances and everything in life is about a balance between what are the things that are advantageous and what are the things that are disadvantageous. So here are some takeaways for you all. Oxygen is obviously critical to multicellular life. I hope I've convinced you of that. But if I haven't, try holding your breath for a couple of minutes and you will find out that I was right about at least one thing in the whole talk. Um, genes work together in networks. And I'm, I hope that for folks who hadn't thought of this before, maybe there's some experts on the, pan, you know, in the, on the audience, but for folks, students who haven't thought about this before, we have genes in our bodies. These genes make products, they make proteins, they make other things that have functions that do stuff in the cell. If, if you have something come into your body and you have to respond to it, many genes turn on to make products, many genes turn off to shut products off, and that's how the cell responds. They work in these networks together. And number three is, a, is sort of a beautiful lesson that I learned very recently from a colleague of mine, 
And this is called Krogh's Principle, uh, named after August Krogh, the, the sort of grandfather of, of comparative physiology and comparative biology. And he, he writes, for a large number of problems, there will be some animal of choice or a few such animals on which it can be most conveniently studied. In other words, everything in nature has shows you a solution as long as you can find the the model of choice to study to help you understand the solution. Um, and this picture is um, uh, Schmidt Nielsen, his one of his proteges. He was a famous for studying camels and their humps and what their humps did. And if you go to Duke's campus, you will see uh, the the beautiful statue of Schmidt Nielsen. You can learn about the history of this uh, Duke professor. Uh, and finally, I want to point out that this is about uh, everything's health. That that one. This is really a one health perspective that we're taking. That the ocean's health is really our health. If we can understand how to leverage and capitalize on these uh, these adaptations that have been uh, that have evolved over millions of years and billions sometimes of years, then we can maybe intervene in human disease. And not everyone always agrees that you should conserve natural systems just for the heck of it, just for the sake of it, right? I certainly believe that, but not everyone will agree with you. And if you can show people who don't agree that there is benefit, there is some good for human uh, health that can come from conserving and preserving these systems, then maybe you bring those people to your table. Maybe you have a productive conversation and you can understand how to sustainably protect these environments. So uh, I see Stober has um, a question. Do you know or look? have you looked at if to see if gene variation in people who live in Tibet? That's a great question. We, we are looking at that and other groups are looking at that. We're looking at Tibetan uh, uh, yaks and antelopes and we're looking at these frogs that have been adapted to high altitude and come back down. We're looking at birds that fly way, way, way up high. Um, and we're looking at all of these different uh, types of organisms because we think there will be shared mechanisms and unique mechanisms and we can find the different ones. That's a great question and the answer is absolutely. So that is my, that's my final slide. I wasn't keeping track of time. I'm sorry, Nancy, if I totally You're missed. Totally fine. You still have about seven minutes left. So oh, go ahead. Yes. Beautiful. Yes. Beautiful. Okay. I just want to shout out all the people who contributed to this particular project. There are many others that we work with, but these are the folks who work directly on the work that I'm, I'm talking about and all of our sources of funding. Um, and, and in, in particular, tr the Triangle Center for Evolutionary Medicine, which gave me my very first grant of a, a small pot of money to do some of these initial studies, um, as well as as well as all of these other funding sources. So thanks and and great questions, everybody. If you have other ones, I'd be I'd be more than happy to chat with you um, now, or you can you can certainly uh, shoot me a, an email or send send me a a Twitter message and I'd be happy to, uh, I'd be happy to talk with you. I'll put my, tw my, my tweet, my Twitter handle in the, in the chat here. Oh, that, this was just a terrific uh, presentation. Thank you so much. I mean, oh, I can read in, in the chat, there are so many people that are really blown away by this. So this is really great. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Um, yes. I mean, you're, you're right. I mean, everything is connected, right? And then it's like this, because when I read your your title, it was like, how can like an animal in the ocean be you know connected to our health? Yeah. But when you put it that way, it just makes total sense. Yeah. So yeah, it's terrific. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, we are um, unfortunately at the end of our presentation. Um, so thank you all so much for coming and thank you, Dr. Jason, for doing this presentation for us. Um, I know I learned a lot. I hope everybody learned a lot as well. And um, we do have a fantastic lineup uh, of other presentations throughout today. So uh, please uh, take a look at our website. And I believe that um, somebody will put the link in the chat as well. So you can take a look at what else we are offering today. 
And um, I also, um, I'm going to share, if you can stop sharing your presentation, please, I, I would love to share like one more slide. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Thank Absolutely. you. Because um, we do want to thank our sponsors, and um, we actually have uh, an anonymous sponsor as well. So let me quickly um, um, talk about that. So thank you so much for uh, the, the members of the Friends of the Museum and all our sponsors. Uh, because of that, you know, all their support, uh, we are able to uh, do these presentations just like a Darwin Day. And um, I also want to mention that yesterday is a virtual day, but we also have an in-person event that will happen Saturday, November 13th, um, and it will start at 10 a.m. till 3 uh, p.m. Uh, right in front of the museum um, on the plaza. And we will have lots of uh, activities and science, uh, you know, experiments and, and crafts and things like that. So please join us as well. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing because I feel like there's more. Oh, yes, there are. Everybody says thank you. So everybody is very excited about your talk. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. I hope I will see you in the other talks. And y'all have a great day. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye.